Good evening, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Wear Many Hats. We are now on episode 24. Um, thank you for your support out there. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, we've got a really exciting episode for you today. Um, we are joined by Gillian Tordoff, the CEO of Complete Transform- Transformations. I can't even get my words out. Um, Gillian has been operating within the procurement sector for over 24 years. So she's going to share some real nuggets and some real helpful hints about her career and how she achieved what she wanted to achieve. Good afternoon, Gillian. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's, no uh, no good. problem at all. Are you having a good day? Yeah, all good. Yeah, yeah. it's all good. Re- retracing the old steps back into town and yeah, uh, yeah, going, yeah. going over old ground. So yeah. So you walked over from King's Cross? I walked from King's Cross. Yeah. How long did it take you? Yeah. Uh, I think it's about 20 minutes, but I was out of breath because I used, to, I used to do that every day and no, yeah. not even flinch now. It's like... I'm the same, Gillian. Uh, to be fair, I, I come into King's Cross as well, but I don't walk it. Yeah. And the only reason I don't walk it is it's not because I'm lazy. I just don't know the way. I'll <laughs> uh, well, have to teach you. Yeah, yeah I, know all the teach ba- you. I know all the ways. Yeah. You will. You'll have to teach yeah. you. Okay, well, listen, Jill, thank you very much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. So we'll, we'll fire in with the first question, shall we? Go for it. So can you tell us a little bit about your career journey in procurement? <sighs> yeah. So yeah, I'm typical procurement. I think when I when I, at my early days, people said to me, ninety eight percent of people fall into procurement. They don't choose it, and I'm one of those ninety eight. It right. was not. It was never in the plan. I um, I came out of came out of uni, wasn't really sure what I was doing. So yeah, I ended up walking to an agency, and they placed, placed me with a company that was an like an agency. It was a nursing agency, and I was doing payroll. Did that for about two weeks, and it was horrific. Right. So I walked out and. Walked into another um, recruitment company. Said, "Just find me anything. I don't care what it is." Yeah. And they found me a job doing export imports exports for right. Roche Pharmaceuticals right. uh, in Welling Garden City. Yeah. So I went there to help a lady who'd been doing it thirty years, and you no, know, uh, you know, she was brilliant, lovely yeah. lady. Um, and yeah, went there, started just doing that. It was just supposed to be a temp job. Yeah. And then I got offered a job um, as internal auditor for the council. Really. Um, and. The guy, the guy I was working for, a guy called Richard Cavell at Roche, who was only a few years older than me, and he was head of procurement. Right. He said, I don't want to lose you. I'm going to make a job for you. Right. So I'm going to make you permanent. So I bet that made you feel good. It was brilliant. It Whenever was brilliant. someone says something like that, it makes oh, you feel really, was, you know. It was the start of something. It yeah. really was. I, really, I owe him a lot. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I joined Roche as, as a perm, um, initially just carrying on with the imports and doing a bit of sort of basic packaging procurement, and I was doing things like um, – like co-packing, right. like distribution, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, but very quickly got into it. And then as people left, I got different roles within it. And so I was picking up more packaging. At one point, I was buying all the bottles and caps for Sinatogen. Really? I was looking after Pro Plus, Feminax. Um, I was looking after all sorts of yeah. um, intro, like, like household names, like things you could pick up off a, a shelf. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was great. And I think, I think we all know Pro Plus, given, yes. given the industry we work in. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, my... my, my um, my relationship with caffeine at that point wasn't good. It's a lot better now. So. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. Same, yeah. I'm, I'm on the decaf as well. Julia. Yeah, so, so I've been off it for 20 years now. Oh, wow. I'm completely off caffeine for 20 years. You are so. doing far better than me because I yeah. stick to decaf at home, but if I'm getting a latte or something, I, yeah. I never say decaf. Yeah. I'm terrible. Yeah. 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 It's weird because I used to drink in the Starbucks downstairs from here. It's gone. Oh. It's been literally in this building where the reception area is downstairs. There used to be a Starbucks. Now, that was my second office. Really? When I was in town. Yeah, I used to, my, my team actually used to put in my calendar second office if I was meeting somebody there. <laughs> so I knew the pub around the corner, the old bar one was third office. Only really? Time, yeah, any time after four. Yeah. That's where I went. So, Fair yeah. Enough. So, yeah, so no, I went to Roche. Um, Rich was brilliant. He, then he said to me, go and, go and get your SIPs qualifications um, and go and join. The big thing he said to me, go and join your local SIPs branch. Right. So off a trot to the old the old clock hotel in Welling North and Welling North uh, Welling North. Just for our listeners that don't know, can you tell us what SIPS is? Yes, Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. Now it was purchase and supply back then. Right. Okay. So cool. I joined. I, I went and I joined SIPS and started doing my studying for that. Yeah. Um, fortunately, the degree I've got, um, business administration degree, meant I was exempt from the first part of it, which oh, was really? great. So it reduced the amount of time of doing the basics. Oh, fantastic! Um, and then so I at the time but then yes yeah, so i went on to this branch meeting which turned out to be a kind of relaunch right. event um, met a guy there called tim pokino right now tim has been pivotal to the rest of my life not just at work he became really? he became my mentor pretty much immediately right um, i joined the committee um became secretary of the beds and hearts branch of sips 
Right. Um, and we relaunched the branch and became the most successful branch in the country at the time. Like really, and it still is, it's a thriving branch. A lot of the branches struggle right. like, to get committee members and struggle to actually run events and things. But yeah. we, were, we were running, we were meeting every two weeks and running at least one event a month. Right. Which, of course, then the people I was meeting, the networking from that really propelled me forward. Then Roche, 2002, I think it was 2001, actually, Roche announced they were going to close the factory in Welling. Right. Uh, which meant my job would be gone uh, yeah. in 2002. And I thought, well, no, I've only done a couple of years. Yeah. I'll move on. Yeah, By that yeah. point, Richard had already gone. He'd gone to Switzerland. He'd, um, right. he'd got his boss's boss's job oh. in Basel at the head office. Well, um, it's all right did. for some, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Hey. Uh, he deserved it. He was a good guy. Um, no, so um, we, I, I left. I went to another pharma company, but I went to a company called um, Innovex, which is part of the Quintiles Group, um, and became... And started doing indirect procurement. Right. Um, while I was there, I mean, I was literally, I was doing things like buying, they, they supply medical reps to the pharmaceutical industry. So I was buying things like champagne. I was buying um, chauffeur cars. I was, it was like the life of luxury. Really? Not that I got any of it, but the, yeah. I think my favorite day there was the day that the new chauffeur company turned up with a, a fleet of S-Class Mercedes, top of the range, and asked for me, the, the fleet manager's face. He was so envious. He was like, can I come and have a look? Can I come and have a look? Like, yeah, really? Can, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's amazing the things that you buy that people yeah. would never think you buy. Yeah. yeah. So, But yeah, so doing that, that was that was good. It was eye-opening, though, and it opened yeah. my eyes to really to what the world of the pharmaceutical industry really is. Right. Um, which was interesting, and that stayed with me. Yeah. Um, so I did that. I did that for, I only did that for 10 months because they were moving their office. I was already doing a 45-mile each-way journey right. to get there. Yeah. Um, which when you're a, a, no, just a senior buyer, it's that's a lot. Yeah. And um, it was around the M25 as well. So some days it take me a couple of hours. Yeah. So it's, that's a, it's a difficult. We've yeah. all we've all suffered with the M25, I think. Yeah. I knew every junction off that M25 on that section. Between, yeah. The bit between the M40 and the A1, I knew every every back road. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I'm a travelling salesman, so I pretty much know everyone, and yeah. I've been stuck at everyone. <laughs> it's chaos. So I did yeah. that. Yeah, I did that for ten months. They moved to Bracknell, and but um, then Tim had got. Um, well, there was a guy we worked with SIPs called Alan, um, Alan Harris, and he'd been involved. With, he was involved with Business Link. Right. And he'd been working with a company in Letchworth, a, um, an aerospace metals company. Right. Um, and they were looking for a head of procurement. Yeah. Um, well, they called it European Purchasing and Inventory Controller, was the official title. Sounds so, nice. next thing I know, I'm doing that job. Right. So, I was doing, I did, so I was buying aerospace metals. Yeah. Um, I was doing everything, directs, indirects. Um, and I was spending a week a month in France. Right. Um, did that for a couple of years, um, and that that was, yeah, it made me grow up. Really, it seriously made me grow up because up to then I'd, I'd been, you no, know, I'd been very young in my career. Yeah. How but, old How old were you then, Gillian? So I'd be when I was there. So I moved. I went to there in twenty in two thousand three. So I would be what about twenty five? Right. When I went there, um, I was I had two employee two people who worked for me. Yeah. Um, so it's my first. It was my first go at managing people. Right. Um, yeah. I had a girl in France who was absolutely fantastic. A girl called Rochelle. She was lovely. Mm. Um, and then I had a guy in the UK who I very quickly found out had got a serious alcohol problem Aye. and had a, a tendency to go off and yeah, right. cause a few issues. Right. To this day, I say if I can manage him, I can manage anybody. Yeah. It was. Agreed. It was. It was. It's a, I think every job you do, you get something from. Yeah. And agreed. that's what I got from that job. Is yeah. that I know that that's my that was my learning on. Confidence in managing other people. Yes, because what because what I went through there with him was was awful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I did that for a couple. I had to I had to get away from there in the end. It was just it was too much. But I learned all sorts of I mean, things. I learned about metal that yeah. People knew. And I went. I got to go around. I mean, I travelled a lot of Europe that doing that. And yeah. I was buying metals um, in Germany, in Switzerland, um, France. Yeah. Got went all over. Um, it was great fun. It was great fun. I mean, going. I think the the probably the. One of the most exciting parts of that was I went to a, a proper foundry in right. Germany where you were. You walk in and there's white hot metal yeah, on yeah, racks yeah. and things, and this guy strips the waist and filthy, and you know, it just and it's that's that's been fantastic for my life now yeah. because I've got an understanding of the steel industry and, yeah. and what goes on. Because my partner now is from Sheffield and his right. dad was in the steel industry, so to understand yeah. that world is quite. Is, is, is good. It's like it gives me that connection. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah of course. With that, yeah. with that side of the family. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, you know, I mean, they will talk about it too. Oh, God. To be fair. Yeah. Oh. I mean, 
I'd, 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 I live up in the uh, mining yes. areas of County Durham and things like that. And, you know, I, I mean, they're very proud of the heritage, as they should be, yeah. because it was the backbone of the UK for a, a significant period of time. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, they do they do talk about it. Oh, yeah, it, they know. do but talk But some very it. interesting stories as well. Yeah, you know? oh, absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it's just amazing. I mean, I mean some of the, the photographs he took of, of yeah. the steelworks and things are incredible. Um, but, yeah, so I ended up there. So I, I moved from there. Well, partly I needed to move, and partly because... The job at Metronet, so mm. working basically working for London Underground, but yeah. as a, through the PPP contractor came right. up. Yeah. Um, sat, I remember Tim ringing me and saying, I've got a recruitment job I'm doing. Do you want one of these jobs? Yeah. And I said, go on, I'll have a look. So he sent me the job specs over. And I said, oh, I'm sure I can do the senior buyer role. He said, no, no. He yeah. said, you're, the category, you're getting a category manager job. Right. Um, and he basically coached me. To be able to do that. that was so that was I started there beginning of two thousand and five. Right. Um, I remember walking into the office, which is next door to here. Um, my, for my first, about my first week, I was so out of my depth. I had no idea what they were talking about. Some of the language they were using, the procurement language, because yeah. to say it was two thousand and five, they were more advanced in their sort of procurement maturity than most businesses I've worked in since. And I yes. still use a lot of what I learned from there now. Yeah. Um, it was it was incredible. Yeah, I, I remember swatting at night to, to make sure because it was bizarre. And I was also I was what twenty what would it be twenty six twenty seven at yeah. that point. And my team and one of the guys was as old as my mum and had been there as no as long as I'd been alive. And, yeah. You now I'd got another guy who was just uh, me, a guy called Darcy Martin who became my right hand man. He was yeah. absolutely incredible. Knew his subject matter. And so I mean, when it comes to soft services and cleaning, nobody knows more than that guy. I'm sure even now, right. absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, they were just to be kind of, I was their manager. Yeah. And it was just bizarre to think, you know, me, little me in my twenties was sitting above them. And no, they, they were both doing it for their own reasons. They you know they could have done the bigger jobs, but they yeah, didn't want Yeah, but they them. chose not to. Yeah, yeah they chose yeah, not yeah. to. And it, yeah. that's, uh, that was their choice, but, and it worked. It worked. Yeah. We had, a, and we, we built a fantastic team. Yeah. Um, when we were doing that, those roles. I mean, I worked with some amazing people. I mean, the operational team and my team became like, you know, they were sort of hand in glove. Yeah, the way we worked, we were so good. I mean, I, I'm in the sort of facilities manager as such. Who basically, you know, you say facilities manager buildings. You know, this guy was running the two thirds of the stations on London Underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. A guy called Mark Rudkin. He and I became almost like we were, we we're best of friends, and we got on fantastically well. Yeah. Um, you know, we 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 drank coffee together. We went out drinking together, and it helped build bond the teams. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and we worked, and then alongside it was a lady called Paula. We worked with who she was the commercial arm. So. My team were pre-contract procurement, mm. and you've got the facilities team, which was Mark's team, yeah. and then you've got Paula's team, who were post-contract yeah. management. So working sort of in a sort of triangular structure, it worked. It yeah. was brilliant. We did you know, we, we handed over contracts. My team only got involved when they needed to. No, it it really really went. To be honest, it's it's a model I still yeah. say to people is the best model now. I think I don't think I've worked with a better way of being. I don't mean to be fair. I think that I would say that that's essential. You know, you, yeah. the, the 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 boots on the ground, as you would say, the operations teams. You know, they need to be able to work hand in hand with procurement, mm. um, especially from a delivery perspective. And then, obviously, what I would probably call finance, that you mm. call commercial. Mm. Um, you know, if the bills aren't being paid properly, then it causes you nothing yeah. but problems. So, yeah. you know, it's great to see that that, that you had that synergy yeah. within your team. Yeah, it worked. It was brilliant. Absolutely. I mean, it was cemented. There were two incidents that happened. Um, while we were there. I mean, we were there. So we, the teams were like that. So it was 2005 I started. I think Mark joined us back end of 2005 and then sort of into 2006. And I stayed till 2008. Yeah. Um, it, the, we, it, within that, we, we had the London bombings. Yes. The, the two bombings. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were, well, we were involved in that. Um, right. I mean, the day of the, the day of the bombings, I was traveling to visit a supplier um, right. in Southwark yeah. uh, with one of my team. Right. And we, we, I'd got the tube. I think I'd got the tube to work that morning because yeah. I was rushing. Yeah. Um, so I got from Kings Cross to Hoban. I'd been in the office for, for a few minutes, and then we went out. We were at Waterloo when the tube was evacuated. Wow. So we'd only got one stop to go on the Jubilee line. So I was on the Jubilee line at Waterloo, um, mm. and we were told to evacuate. And I was like, "Oh great, here we go." Something. And they were saying power surge. That yeah. was, that was the, uh, the the story was power surge, and we, I was like, "No, we win the Olympics yesterday." Yeah. And today. This happens, you know. We've we've screwed it up. The underground has screwed it up. Yeah, you know, something. And you you automatically think it's going to be something that one of the contractors has done. 
Yeah. Which one of my contractors <laughs> has screwed it up now? Uh, and, right. and you go into that, oh, God, no. So we, got, so we get to this supplier's office, and they were... So they provided maintenance guys around the underground, basically like a handyman service for the stations. Right. Um, so guys all over the network. We get there, and we hear on the radio, actually, it's bombs. And it was just... We, we just we abandoned the meeting. It was like, like they needed to trace their guys, oh, course, make sure everything yeah. was safe. Obviously, everything was off. Yeah. So we walked back from Southwark to Hoban. Um, it was eerie because there was, obviously there was no there was no electrical buzz that you don't you don't even know it's there, mm. but until it's not. Yeah. But the electrical buzz that the underground creates. There were no, there were no buses. There were no. no I mean, obviously, all the cabbies had just gone whoosh out, oh, of, of, out of town. Yeah. Um, and everything. You know, there was nobody on the streets. It was proper tumbleweed. You know, like a ghost town. It was really bizarre. Yeah. And um, we got back to the office. Um, and we had to we had to come in through the back door. The front doors. Everything was locked down. You weren't allowed near the windows because yeah. they obviously didn't know what was happening. Yeah. Um, and then it turned out that the only person involved in London Underground who'd received any injuries was. A lady who'd been in my team, uh, one of the buyers, um, she'd been on the um, a lady called Tracy Braid. She'd been on the Piccadilly line at King's Cross. Right. So she got on at King's Cross in the same carriage as the bomber. And she'd moved down in where the, bo- the bomber had stayed at one end of the carriage. She'd moved down the carriage and yeah. they probably saved her life. Um, and she was one of the last people for that. I mean, she, yeah, she, she was injured. She didn't. I wouldn't say I don't want to say it's not life changing. Physically, not life changing injuries, but mentally, oh, absolutely. Men- I mean, it mentally, it must yeah. Have, I mean, yeah, God, she, I mean, uh, what what happened that day was just. It was awful. It yeah. was. Awful. I remember her. She'd rung up because the only she told me afterwards she the only number she could remember was the room bookings number for work. In the back in the day when you used to have to ring a number to book yeah, a room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. So that's the only number she could remember. She, so somebody lent her a phone to ring to say, "I'm no, this is where I am, and this is where they're taking me." Yeah. And spoke to one of my colleagues. Um, and then later in the day, her, her, I think it was her sister that rang to say, no, they hadn't heard from her. Did we know where she was? And sort of the relief in her sister's voice that, you know, she's alive and she's she's safe. But, yeah, we, we, we were stuck in the office. I think it was it was about four o'clock. Yeah. Um, and it was basically a case of, right, we're going to make, no, we're going to sort this. You know, I mean, there was nothing we could do at that point. But for the yeah. next, I remember walk, it was a gang, basically we, we all grouped into which way do you walk to get back to your mainline station to get home. Yeah. Um, and I remember a gang of us walking all the way to Finsbury Park. Yeah, because that was that's where they were letting trains out of eventually, and then it was every stop, you know, and they were sort of t- taking different trains to get home. But the aftermath, the f- few weeks after, it was all, you know, I remember signing invoices off for the clean up operation and yeah. and all that, and just you know, a lot of all my contracts. I'm sitting there at home in the evening after that night, watching the news on the TV back in the day when I did that kind of thing. Yeah, watching the contractors and going, I know what they do, I know yeah. what they do, and just cringing, and thinking, thank God most people don't know. Yeah, what those people are there for, because you know yeah. some of the. The, the jobs that people have to do on the underground are awful. I mean, oh, I, yeah, I imagine it's yeah. not. Um, yeah, but I mean, I learned so much about job. So it really, it took me to a whole other level. Yeah, um, and it probably really. I think I still say, although it was all that time ago, that was my big break. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. took me from sort of being an ordinary senior buyer, um, with because uh, I mean, even when I was doing the metal thing, it was only a small company. Yeah, it took me to a level that I, I've never gone back from, and it yeah. uh, it, it taught me things that. You know, I suppose it taught me the procurement knowledge that I could never have got from a textbook. Yeah, would, you know, how- would, would you say it was quite a, a sort of a pressure cooker environment? You know, just just because I mean, obviously you've got the profile associated with the business, um, you've got you know just the millions of people that use it every day, yeah. and then just you know just the raw materials, I guess, to, that you have to procure to keep it going. Yeah, on a daily basis, it's just astounding. I think the biggest thing with it was the the politics. Yeah. The politics was probably the biggest challenge because the contract, the con- so the contract that Metronet had with London Underground was so complex. I mean, it was it was a tome. It really was, mm. um, and it was all about um, customer satisfaction. Yeah, um, and we we back to backed a lot of our contracts with our contractors yeah. to pass on that. Um, so particularly, I think, especially, I mean, cleaning was classic. Yeah. I mean that contract was no, it was it was a tone. It really was, yeah. um, and it was all mystery stop stopper schools. I mean, I, the things I learned about what to clean on the tube, where, yeah. and we uh, historically they'd cleaned all the tube identically, yeah. Uh, but because with this mystery shopper thing, it was a case of certain elements of the underground scored a lot higher than others, right. so they were more likely to be checked. There, were, there was more, so we we focused the labour. Thrown onto the sort of facility, we focused the labour on the high traffic, high yeah. impact areas. So there's, there was a, a, a lesser used corridor at King's Cross that was worth more in mystery shopper skirts 
than some of the outlying stations completely. Really? So we put all the effort. Yeah. You know, we had we had a lot of cleaners twenty four seven on say on King's Cross on Victoria all the different big yeah. stations. I mean, you go out to somewhere like you know, the outer like, reaches of the Metropolitan Line, there might be one station, one cleaner between three stations. Right. Because it made sense, and that yeah. we saved a fortune. Yeah. No, we no thirty well thirty million spend, and we took no we I think we I think we took about seven or eight million off it when wow. we did when we did the re scoping and the yeah, yeah, the re specking yeah. of it um, because. It was all obviously all about the labour, you know. You know, well, it's, it's all it, about the labour. I mean, it is, isn't it? In soft yeah. services, it is very yeah. much labour driven. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was, um, yeah, we did a you know, massive exercise. I mean, the other thing we did, which comes on to the second big thing that happened while I was there, was we put all the wages up. Yeah. So instead of paying minimum wage, we paid above minimum wage. So a base cleaner, daytime cleaner on a station. Yeah. Um, at the time, minimum wage was five oh five. I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. we made it five pound fifty for them. Right. Yeah. So we let that contract autumn time two thousand five. Mm. It was February two thousand six when I came into work. Found yeah. a Transport and General Workers Union envelope on my desk full of pay slips, which said minimum wage on them from one particular contractor. Right. Um. So it was like, oh dear, this isn't good. Yeah. This is not good. It's like, okay, let's think what we're going to do here. So yeah, I go to the procurement director and said, I think we might have a little problem. Yeah. Um, it's like, well, what are we going to do? So up, up the stairs we toddled to the eighth floor, which was where the big bosses were with their big plush carpets, um, <laughs> going and see the CEO, which, I mean, to be fair, where I was, I used to go and see him quite a lot. So it wasn't, yeah. it, it was, it, it wasn't as big a deal as it probably thinks, I think it is in my head now. Yeah. Um, so off I told him. And he said, no, I want them out. I don't want this. No, we can't have this. We can't upset the unions. Yeah. Um, and I said, right, rather than just get them out, let's get them in and see if we can yeah, fix resolve it. it. Yeah, resolve yeah, it. Yeah, 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 course, this, is, yeah. this is my way of being. That's how I do things. Yeah. Well, got this guy in. And he was the most arrogant, rude, obnoxious man I think I've ever dealt with as a supplier. Really? He was horrendous. I can't afford to pay it. He said, well, you signed up to it, mate. I can't afford to. Well, you're off then. Yeah. You know, it's not on. You, you know, that money was not for your pocket. Yeah. You know, if you couldn't win. The thing is, I we hadn't done the deal. Yeah. The deal, we, um, when, before I arrived on the underground, they'd had one of the big consultancies in. I won't name names. But yeah, yeah, of course. They left yeah. Carnage, uh, right. which is very similar to their name. But they, they, had, <laughs> they, 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 they They'd done their, their, they'd done it all textbook. No, they'd yeah. come in, they'd done a textbook tender and yeah, you know, yeah, not yeah. really thought about it. And we at the time we were saying we don't they, they, we weren't that supplier weren't great yeah. uh, reputationally anyway, so perhaps we shouldn't have done it. But yeah. um anyway, we so yeah, so he was like this. So back to the CEO we're going, yeah, we're gonna have to get rid of him. He said, Right, get him off now. I said, Look, give me a week. Yeah. Just give me a chance because I've got to get somebody else in. Four four hundred cleaners, eighty nine stations, and we've got to cheapy them in a week. Yes. Okay, we can do this. So yeah. um contacted the second supplier in the tender. Yeah. Who, who weren't a supplier to Metronet at all. Yeah. Said, Do you want this job? Now, I mean I remember meeting across the road, there was a Renaissance um, yeah. hotel at the time, meeting there and having secret meetings with them and right. doing the no, sort of doing the deal yeah. very quickly. Um and I remember going at the time our office, they'd moved us out of Templar House. Right. Um, because they were doing some, they were doing some renovation work, moving people around, and it's a bit like one of those kids' puzzles where you know you need a space to be able to move, yeah, to make the picture. So right. uh, our procurement director Nick Sumption, being the nice guy that he is, volunteered the procurement department to move out the building while they did the shuffling to give them right. the space. So okay. after, so we were on the second, thirty second floor of Euston Tower, the old Capital Radio building at the time. Oh, nice, uh, fantastic views. Yeah. So we're up there trying to do this deal, and then. Um, we had to, we had to organise trips to Manchester to do audits of the supplier because of course it being clean you know you, you've got to be so careful with yeah, right to work it. and things yeah yeah so yes yeah. yeah, so and we had an internal audit team and uh, yes yeah, so we, we were going to, and I remember uh, Darcy sitting there one afternoon he's on the phone with um, the chief exec of Initial who, who were coming in yeah. having this conversation and um, no quite intense negotiation going on on this phone I could hear him and he's got the internal audit guy bless him going. Can you ask him if there's a hotel nearby that does a good breakfast for me when I got the audit? And he's like, Can you tell him to off, please? And he comes off the phone and he said, He just went to me, I'm going, I'm going for a fag, he says, before I throw him out the window. I thought, yeah, 32 floors up, that's gonna make a mess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, exactly. But yeah, it was really intense. I feel like I didn't sleep well. I ended up I remember being on a train heading for Manchester on one of these sort of West Coast trains all wobbly, yeah. and I was full of cold. And yeah, it just I yeah. felt awful, and I, I, was, I was up there, and I stayed in a hotel near Old Trafford, and oh yeah, and I was in there doing this audit, and yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy, and I just 
But the way it all came together, so the operational team, they were out there on the ground. You know, the, the cleaning inspectors were out there on the ground, making sure every cleaner knew what was going on, yeah. um, making sure everybody got the right, got all new PPE. I mean, that's replaced everything, boots the lot. Yeah. You know, basically, the old contractor did nothing to help, obviously. Yeah. They yeah. were not happy. I believe that the business didn't survive much longer after that. Right. I don't think it did them any good because it made the front page of the Metro, front page of the Evening Standard, we made, I think it was the, one of the about page five of the Daily Mail, and we made the BBC local news. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I would say that if you know, if you don't look after your people yeah. and you don't do the right thing for the right reasons, yes, um, then you know, fair enough, you know. Yeah. Uh, do you know something? Fair play to TFL as well, actually, yeah. um, and your entire team for for actually saying, you know, because that could have been, you could have taken the easy ride there and just went, oh doesn't matter let's mm. just fire on but instead you went right we're going to take the pain and yeah. we're going to do this because it's the right thing yeah. to do and it cost a fortune because yeah. because it was such a quick change we ended up doing a cost plus contract initially right which is expensive you know, yes, it's an expensive profits. way of doing things generally yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's that was the only option we had really because it was yeah. case of, we've got to do it fast we don't really know what terms these people are coming over on? You know, every single cleaner had to be spoken to. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was. It do do. And but you know, it took a few months to settle. I mean, oh, of the, course, yeah. the day that it reduced due to start, I'm coming into King's Cross. So I think I'd actually been home that night, and I came to King's Cross. I walked into King's Cross tube station and saw them all in their new high visits with the right logo on the back, and I went, "We've done it." Yeah. I can't believe it, but we've done it. And my God, I was just yeah, it was just amazing. But I think having the teams like they were. I mean. All credit to every one of my team. They weren't all involved. Yeah. Um, you know, it was basically myself and Darcy that did that project, but the rest of the team basically took every bit of our workload. Yeah. You know, there was nothing that they needed. They just did it. They just, you know, they ran the, the rest of the team. I mean, they were an incredibly high performing team. Yeah. Um, and at one point, um, we had a we had a guy in that it was when it was all sort of towards the end, and it was it was the the PPP thing was starting to fall apart, and yeah. Metronet was on its knees. Um, because Nick Sumption had it was from Thames Water, so he got pulled back to Thames Water because he was out in secondment. Right. Um, and there's another guy came in, and he was like, "Oh no, look at that team! They're really high performing. How about if we split that team amongst all the other teams? Because there are about five or six teams. Yeah. And we'll 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 spread that brilliance amongst them all. And I was like, that doesn't it doesn't work like that. No. They're brilliant because they're together, and they're brilliant yeah. because they're a team. They're an effective team. They yeah. work well together. Yeah. yeah they you get can't on. see the seams. No. You know, you couldn't you couldn't see you know, you couldn't see anybody's weaknesses because somebody else's strengths were covering them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and the team together worked. And when they once when they did break the team up, they really it it, it destroyed that sort of relate that way the way of working. It and fragmented things. it. Yeah, it yeah, did fragment yeah, yeah. it. I mean one of the guys they took away and tried to put him in another team. It didn't work, they brought him back. I, he came right. back to us. <laughs> and I'm so glad he did because he was he was what I, I described him as my detail man. I mean, this guy yeah. could, he would proofread something to the point there wasn't an I without a dot. Right, okay. um, you know, it would take hours. Yeah, but and but he would make sure everything was perfect, and that was his role. Yeah. So you'd never give him a project where he'd got to finish it all, but you give him that bit. Yeah, and he do it, and, and I'm not detailed at all. I'm yeah. hopeless. You know, it's so yeah, it worked. It, yeah. it absolutely worked. As Liam Neeson always says, they had a particular set of skills. Absolutely, yeah, but it's yeah, all you yeah. need from the team. You need you need a set of skills. Yeah, everybody can't be brilliant at everything. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, I, I think you know we've all got strengths and weaknesses. So yeah. you know, use the people. You know, try not to get people to do things that they're not comfortable with. Yeah, you know, you want them to to grow and develop and learn. So you want to push it a little bit, but you know, if it's something that they're just not comfortable, you're not going to get the best out of them. Yeah, so move them in a direction that suits their skill set, personality, capabilities, yeah. and so on. So yeah. it's mad really though, because even what we it's now. I think it's now it's fifth or is it 2008 I left there. So it's 15 years since I left the underground. Yeah. And I still have two of the team that I'm in touch with who still call me boss. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. And con contact me. Because one of the guys now, he he's done brilliantly for himself. He's um lad, he was um Rodney, he was from um Ghana, he was from originally. Oh, really? Right. And he he married his his wife was from the Seychelles. Right. Um and they moved back to the Seychelles. And last thing I heard, he was Sort of high up in procurement for the Seychelles government. Really? So I thought, brilliant. No, what a result. No, yeah, really good nice, lad, good nice, lad. Not, yeah. not a bad place to live either, the Seychelles, yeah. is it? To be fair. So, so, so that kind of takes us to where you are now. So yeah. to, tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you're running your own business now, yeah. which, you know, has its own challenges. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, life changed a lot. So, yeah, as I was, while I was on the underground, I got into coaching. So Tim, that I'd been doing my SIP stuff with, um, got into 
coaching, got into life coaching. Yeah. Um, and without my knowledge, when we were having our SIPs meetings, he was coaching me. All right. um, and 2006, he said to me, come and... Um, you know, come on this coaching course. You know, it's basically a leadership and management course. You know, it'd be great yeah. for you, you know, with your team and things. So off I toddle on my, my course in October 2006 with him. Yeah. And I came back a different person. Um, right. I mean, I wrote an article at the time to be different when I go home. Yeah. Because um, that's what I, when he asked me at the beginning of the, the session, like, like people do on training courses, what do you want to get from it? I said, to be different when I go home. So, yeah. uh, my God, I was different when I went home. I was really? so different. It completely changed who I was. So up to that point, I'd been all career focused. I'm going to be a procurement director. I'm going to be this. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to be yeah. a CPO. Right. Um, I came away going, I'm not sure I'd want to be in procurement. Oh, I completely. Wow. It completely changed my mindset. Yeah. So when um, I left the underground um, 2008, because it had gone into administration, it was back in LUL, and it was becoming very much, it was very public sector focused, yeah. and it was going that way, which is not me. It's too restrictive. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am quite... Maverick, and I'm quite free spirited, so I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be tied by policies and. You like to be dynamic, think yeah, outside the box. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, I don't even yeah. have a box. Right. No. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, we don't do boxes. Yeah, no, I, read no that, boxes. I read that this yeah. morning. I thought that's brilliant. That is so me. That's a good um, saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I. Yeah. So I ended up. So I left the underground, and um, I got I got contacted by an outfit that, that back then were called Buying Team, and now Proxima. Right. Um, so got a guy called Edward Winchlard and contacted me. He got. Um, some soft services stuff and temp labor stuff he was doing with a couple of hotel chains. Right. And uh, needed somebody to come in and look after it and do stuff with it. So I went in there as an interim. Literally, they are Redline Square. That's oh, right. where they were based at the time. Yeah, so I was yeah, around yeah. the corner from where I'd been, which was a bit strange. Yeah. Um, so I went in there to do that, um, working with um, a couple of their big hotel clients and sort of international chains. Mm. Um, yeah, great. It's great experience, and, but it got me into consultancy. Yeah, and it got me thinking. I like consultancy. This suits me. Now it all fell completely wrong. Yeah, the timing was terrible. So right. I joined there in the August. Mm. By October, I was pregnant with my son. Now, as an interim, that ain't great. So oh, I spent the first probably two, three months trying to keep the nausea at bay so that nobody'd notice because I oh, did because so- I wanted to keep my job. See, that's really now that's a very interesting topic. You know, you know, because is it right that you felt that way? You know, and, and no, it isn't. No, it's not. You it's know, not. But and I was an interim, and interims go, you, you don't have to keep them. So I did, I was a bit naughty. I kept it at bay. I got them, they, they, they decided to make me permanent. So I took a permanent job, even though that right. wasn't my intention. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. never intended to go permanent with them. I, I, know, I, I set my heart, heart on being an interim. Well, your circumstances have changed. Though. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, I mean, that's one thing, you know, a baby on the way, but, you know, it makes you think slightly differently about yeah. your own aspirations and what yeah. you want to do out of life. Yeah. You know, I wanted a job to come back to. It's of really course. what I was after. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know how I'd feel afterwards, whether you know, interim would work for me. Mm. So, yeah, so anyway, so I did I did some work for them. I, and I worked for Hilton Hotels. I worked for IHG. I did some work for Reuters. Right. Um, wow. Yeah, which was, that was, that was fascinating. I bet it, it was, so, yeah. It's, it's, it's so prestigious on the outside. Right. And I'm like, it's different on the inside. Really? It's very different. But that's Let's not going into any detail. That's, but, but yeah, that's, 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 to be honest, my experience is that is a lot of businesses that, yeah. you know, they, they're almost like, they're like swans. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, everything looks graceful on the surface, but they're paddling away underneath. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's well, how that's, businesses run. Yeah. You know? of course and it's, it is, yeah. No, Reuters was no different. You know, yeah. it was paddling away underneath. Yeah. Uh, great people. You think it's this silky operation, but yeah. in reality, they're just the same. It as only everybody. works because somebody's paddling like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. great. I mean, I was based at, um, for that, it was only for a couple of months. I was based at St. Catherine's Dock. You know, you know oh, walking around there at lunchtime was just, you know, you'd walk out and all the yachts. And, yeah, oh, yeah, and, yeah. 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 And yet there was a really nice greasy spoon around the corner that was, yeah. you know, even though it was touristy, it was, it wasn't touristy. So, yeah, there's got to well, there's got to be a greasy spoon around Absolutely. every corner, doesn't Absolutely. there? Absolutely. There was one on Baker Street when I used to work at Baker Street for the underground too. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, 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 gotta love it. But yeah, so I, I did. Yeah, that. So it kind of got me into got me into the consultancy world. Yeah. In a way, so I did that, and you no, know, I did a few, few for them. I came back from maternity leave um, and did a, a couple of others for them. I worked for Morrison Supermarket School, and so I was doing right. I was doing consultancy, but as an employee. Yeah. Which actually. For anybody wanting to get into consultancy, that's quite a good way to start. Right. Because it kind of breaks you in gently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you get the feeling of being a consultant without the, I suppose, the nervousness of not having a regular paycheck. Yes. Now, yes. Yeah, you've still got that regular paycheck. You're still an employee. You've still got all the sort of the, the good bits that go with being an employee, but you've got the excitement of working with different clients and being in different locations. Yeah, and, yeah. And no, that I get that. that. Yeah. So I, I did work with some good, some good outfits and did some good stuff with them. Mm. Um, but it was... London every day. 
Yeah. And I'd got a six month old. And I was going, I was leaving the house at seven in the morning, getting home at seven at night. I didn't see him apart from weekends. That's hard, isn't it? Yeah. That, I mean, it, that's a difficult it was, thing to do. It was tough. It wasn't, I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Because I, and then, you know, I'd have days when, it was like, oh no, you need to be here later. I'm like, I'm not being here later because if I don't leave, if I don't leave the office by five, I don't see him. He'd be asleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and officially we were supposed to work to quarter to six. And I was like, no, I can't. I just can't do this much longer. Yeah. And then my husband at the time was working for Associated British Foods, so right. um, they and nobody looked at their indirect procurement for a few years. They, the previous guy had gone off into the sunset, and they needed somebody to look at it. So he, he suggested that they bring me in to do it. So in I go. It's only in Peterborough. I was living in Huntingdon. Lovely. Ideal. And it was actually yeah. home-based officially. Oh, brilliant. So although little one was still in, um, I say little one, he's nearly six foot now. Right. Um, although he was, he was in um, he was in um, Childminder, at least I could pick him up and I was there and, and things. So, yeah, well, you felt like you were part of his life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I mean, I've got a little one now, you know, and, 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 you know, one of the things that I quite like about my job now um, is that occasionally I work from home. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, we we, uh, we had Abby during COVID, so yeah. I actually got to see everything, you know, which yeah. I never got to see with my, with my older two, Holly yeah. and Ethan. But with Abby, I saw a walk, I saw a roll, I saw a talk, and saw absolutely everything, which was yeah. amazing. So, uh, I'm, I, and, and I think as well, so men miss that a lot. You yeah, know, yeah. people don't realise that. Yeah. But, see, roll with us, know, roll with yeah. us in my family, because my husband at the time, he worked in Peterborough already, because yeah. he was already, um, and he was doing a nine-to-five job. So yeah. he was doing all the drop-offs, the pick-ups, no, he was seeing him a lot of the time, and I wasn't. I, I've always been sort of the big career, yeah, um, type. So, yeah, and obviously, I was still in my coaching mindset. Of, I don't really want to be doing this. I was doing it to pay yeah, the bills. Yeah, so yeah. I went and did this for a year. But again, I learned loads. I mean, yeah. I, I, I developed sort of tools there that I still use now. I mean, like creating data cubes. I remember yeah. going to the interview and going, "How many supplies have you got? What do you spend?" And them going, "We don't know. We don't know." I was like, well, "Okay, that's my first month then." Working yeah, out. yeah, yeah. And that's now something I offer to my clients. Yeah. You no, know, give me a download of your. Um, your invoices for yeah. 12 months and I will create something that I can manipulate I, mean, I call it a data cube but it, call yeah. it what you like dashboard you know, that you can look at by category what do you spend and, yeah, and that's yeah, how yeah. now I drive opportunity as well right. so you can see you know, it gives you an insight as to what, what's going on in the business how many supplies that they got what they're yeah, spending yeah. who they're spending it with it also gives you some empirical data that you can take to them yeah and because they probably don't know yeah so because you know it gives you the opportunity to say right well this is what you spent I bet nine times out of ten they're very very surprised yeah I would assume yeah they are and then I mean with them with, with that particular outfit they've got mill managers around the country so they're running feed, animal feed mills around the country yeah um, and I did it with them that I'd run this report every month and it would tell me where the leakage was from the contract and where they were using no, where they were non-compliant, they were they were using their own suppliers. Yeah. And I'd ring them up and go, get your answers ready. It's going to the boss in two days' time because the supply, they work for the supply chain manager. Yeah, yeah. So I give yeah. them a heads up. Yeah. Um, it took two months before the compliance just went straight through the ceiling. And wow. but I think we saved about twenty five thousand just with the compliance, just on silly little things, just what, you, what we call the tail spend. Yeah. Um, but that's so that's that became another tool that's now in the arsenal. Yeah. That I use so. Uh, it's absolutely yeah, it's brilliant. So I did that. I did that for a year, and then we decided that we didn't need to live in commuter land anymore. So yeah. I've been living in Huntingdon, in a big house, and you know, sort of pre-child life, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was like, why are we living in commuter land in this big, expensive house when we don't work in London anymore? Let's move. So we moved to yeah. Bourne in Lincolnshire, and I gave up work for four years. Right. I meant to give up for a year or two. I yeah. thought I'd spend some time with the boy, get settled in. I was at home for six months or so um but i was doing the house move mainly and i was it was like what can i do now what can i do now i'm not yeah you know, i remember sitting on one occasion sitting in one of these baby toddler groups and having almost like an out of body experience and going what the hell are you doing ah. this is so not you so yeah. i ended up setting up a, a facebook group for mums initially right. to for meeting for play dates and things and trying to get sort of get mums together it grew um became, well there's there's loads of them now yeah i know but this was back in 2012 and they barely existed oh wow it was so it was one, probably one i don't think it was one of the first in the country but it was certainly the first in that area yeah um but yeah so i grew this facebook group to, so we ended up with two and a half thousand members in a town of twelve thousand people and wow. i'd only it was only open to parents yeah business people who ran businesses right in the town because i didn't want just I didn't want it to become a free for all. Like, you know, you get these local groups now, which are basically where people just slang, have slangy maps. Yeah. You, I didn't yeah. want that. It became a 24 hour operation, though. Well, because, I bet it did, yeah. because people were 
Um, I mean, you would. I mean, I'd rule. I'd so many rules. You know, you're not allowed to slag off the business. You're not allowed to slag businesses off because in a town that size, you can destroy somebody overnight. Oh, of course, you can. Yeah. So I was really yeah. strict, but I learned so much about marketing and SEO and things wow. because off the back of that, because the information that was going on there was the same over and over again. I said, set up a website. Yeah. So it was actually my my ex husband who had the idea. Why don't you set up a website? And he started it. Then um, he decided that we ought to join the local chamber of commerce. Right. So off to Bourne Business Chamber. Um, yeah. I think he went the first time and then I went. And yeah. the guy who ran that was a financial advisor. Right. And at the time, my now ex-husband was desperate to get into financial advice. Right. And so he um, he got introduced to this guy, um, then got introduced to him. I mean, he's now big wig financial advisor, finance director for a company. Right. Now, off the back of that. So that little interlude absolutely rocketed his career, because he'd been an accountant before that, yeah. rocketed his career and gave me this kind of sort of little world. I ended up building websites and um, doing social media for local businesses because they saw what I was doing. And went, wow. Can you do mine? Can you do mine? Because the website that we built, we were selling advertising to local businesses. Um, right. So I got to know a guy called James Cotton, who's a um, flooring guy who can sell ice to Eskimos. Yeah. And he basically went and sold this service to all the trades. Really? Yeah, it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And in return, in return for that, he got free advertising. It was like win-win. Fair enough. It was absolutely fantastic. So we did that. So I did that for one. Then I got involved with Lincolnshire Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Um, and they... Um, I was talking to a lady at one of their events and she said, oh, I'm trying to, I'm running um, workshops for micro, small and micro businesses. She said, one of the ones we're doing is on finance. Yeah. She said, isn't that kind of what you do? I said, well, I do procurement. I said, but I could talk to them about, you know, the best way to, you know, best suppliers to have, you know, how to do your procurement at a high yeah. level. So I ended up running these workshops and I thought, what am I doing? I might as well be doing this properly and getting yeah. paid proper money for it. Yeah, so that's when I went, right, that's it. I'm going back into interim. Right. Um, and I've not looked back. I mean, I've done, I've done some fixed term roles. Yeah. I've done some sort of through agency. And then I got involved with um, EBIT Intelligent Procurement a couple of years ago. Um, and from there went, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to set up myself. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it's just gone from strength to strength. So the yeah, Complete Transformations was born. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah, but the Complete, it's, it's strange. The name of the company is, is Complete, but spelt as in Complete, as in L P L E A T at the end. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Based on the um, Isaac, it's Isaac Walton, the complete angler. Right. So, because the complete cause Isaac Walton wrote a lot of his book um, at a hotel that's now called the Isaac Walton at Dovedale in Derbyshire, right. which is where I did my coach training in two thousand and six. Really? Because without the coach training, I wouldn't be doing this. Because oh. it, it's the coach training that gave me the direction and the sort of the confidence yeah. to be able to just do whatever I choose to do and to be out the box and just be would, myself. Would you say it also gave you a bit of an entrepreneurial edge yeah. it's just, slash it, it, spirit? It's, it's given me a completely different way. I mean, I used to be – I talk about my life in colours phases. Yeah. So you know, I, have to, I, I have to rephrase it these days because I, I had a bit of an epiphany last year where I realised – so up to prior to 1994, I yeah. was multicoloured, like most kids. I was bright, colourful, yeah, yeah, happy, yeah. you know, just nuts. Then I went through a black phase from 17 at 1994 – through to when I was 30, when I did my coaching, I, I, I call my black me. Right. Which, who was not happy, very right. career focused, yeah, very yeah, materialistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I had some fantastic experiences in that time, but looking back on them, they'd have been even better now because yeah. I then went, I then started to create the colour. So I did my coaching and I remember sitting in the office in Templar House thinking, I need pink. I'd always hated pink. Even as a child, I'd hated pink. I remember my mum put me in a dress. Um, from my uncle's wedding in 1985 and a pastel pink dress, the same as my sister. <laughs> and I hated it because I just, right. I don't, I've never liked to be the same as others and it yeah. wasn't me and it wasn't, anyway, I, the, I wanted pink, but it had to be hot pink. And I walked the entire length of Oxford Street in my lunch hour to find the right pink. Right. And ended up with this jumper, cashmere jumper that I had to have. You know, it cost me a fortune. I was like, yeah. I don't care. I've got to have this. Because yeah. I went through pink me phase. And then when I had right. my children, I, it, it kind of blurred a bit because it does, I mean, it affects your coaching and everything. So I did, yeah. it blurred. And then I became, yeah. And then that's what, what are you now? Multicolored. Back, Back to, to multicolored. Multi very, very multicolored. You've gone all full circle. Then. I've gone full circle. Yeah. Thanks to right. a, a very old friend who got in touch last year and went, do you mean you were all black and dark back then? No, you weren't. Yeah. You were, you were great. You were like, you were really colorful. And yeah, you said, what did he say? Um, you were always like a rebel. There was always a, what was it? There was always, you were like a rebel trying to get out. He said, there was always yeah. a slightly wild streak to you. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I think she's out now. Well, I can attest to that based on our conversations. Yes. Yeah. Um, without a doubt. All right. So look, I mean, what advice would you give to somebody that was moving into the, the you know, that procurement field? What, what would you, you know, if you, if you could go back all those years ago and tell, 
tell little black Gillian. Yeah. Um, what what advice would you give I'd Gillian? I'd say get into it. Just go and get get go and find a job, even if it's doing admin in a purchasing yeah. team, and get yourself a mentor. Because yeah. I think what made it for me was say Richard gave me the first kick to make me go up the hill, yeah. and then since then Tim's. Oh, well, Tim's still there. You know, yeah. he's still pushing me upwards. Yeah. He's still pushing me whichever direction I need to go. Um, so having a mentor behind you is incredible. Do, do you know something, Gillian? That, that's re- everybody that we've had on the podcast that has had an element of success throughout their career. I think everybody so far has mentioned mentor mm. and how important um, either an individual that recognised your talent and took mm. you on a journey, yeah. um, or alternatively facilitated. Um, you know, a learning and development program or something like that. That mentor element is coming across as being crucial. Absolutely. Um, you know, and you know, I would advise anybody listening that's looking to start a career, find that mentor yes, now. Absolutely. I've got a few people that I mentor. Yeah. Uh, now it's nice to be able to do it for others now. Even yeah. though, and sometimes, I, sometimes I have moments where I, I have to go to my mentor. Although I say it as a mentor now, but a lot of mine now is coaching because I'm a coach. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a qualified coach now as well, which is a whole other level of. Uh, yeah, doing yeah, things, yeah. But yeah. we'll need we'll need another podcast for that one. I think, absolutely, we Don't absolutely. We? Well, we'll do we'll we'll do um, the Gillian Todd off episode two. Yes, I think, yeah. And the focus coaching, on the coaching. The coaching is something else, but yeah, it does not help when you're negotiating with suppliers. That's all I'll say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet, I yeah, bet. Absolutely. Okay. Well, listen. Tell tell us a little bit about you, Gillian. So, you know, what's what what do you like to do? You know, socially, but you know, within that work parameter as well. Mm. What do I do. People say to me, "How do you have time to do everything?" So I do a lot. I, I, well, what do I do? I'm very, I'm very political. I suppose right. is one thing I do. Kind of that's kind of that's away from work, but it's part of what I am. And um, I mean, I was a town councillor for a while when I was in Bourne. Off Were you really? What, off the back of what I was doing with right um, the websites and and things. Yeah, I got asked to be a, come on the town council, so I did that for like 2015 to 2018 when I moved away from the town. Wow. Um, so yeah, that but that was I'm not when I say I'm political, I'm not in any way remotely affiliated with any party. I'm very, very much in, very, very independent. You got your own thoughts. I've got my and, own thoughts and yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I've got involved fairly recently with an outfit called Independence for Newark, who right. um came into a Tory stronghold. Right. Um in Newark where the, the the council was heavily dominated by what I would call the old guard of Tories who'd been in the position for years. And they've yeah. they've well they've wiped the town council out and they've well, they've taken the majority the Tories now haven't got a majority. They've now made it down to, uh, I think they went from 29 out of 39 seats to 14. Oh, wow. Uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, there's now 11 independents on that district council. That's quite is, impressive, isn't it? It's like incredible. 11 independents, especially, yeah. given, especially given how our political, um, you know, elections and things like that run. Yeah. Does, obviously, is it, I think, does, do, they still, do they operate on first past the post and things like yeah. that as well, do they? Yeah, it's just the same, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, so that yeah, is yeah. impressive. I mean, yeah. that, was, that was something I'd never done up until recently. I went, to the, I went and watched the count. Right. Um, that was really fascinating. If ever anybody you know, gets the opportunity to go and watch a um, no, political no, election count, really? it's fascinating. The behaviours and the sort of, yeah, the egos involved, it's just entertainment. Who needs TV when you can watch pompous really? people poncing about and thinking they're more important? Yeah, well, it's great fun. Do you ever, do you ever watch um, Blackadder? Yes, I love did, Blackadder. Did you watch Blackadder the first one? Well, yeah. No, the second, the second season yeah, where, they did, the where they did they uh, they did the fake election. Yes. And, that, I mean, like it was parody, but it was you know if you think about it, quite quite accurate. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Turn, yeah, in, in yeah pit the younger, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah pit nappies. the younger. As I think a potato won in the end. Yes, didn't they? yes, <laughs> <laughs> that as well. But yeah, yeah. Don't get me started on. Yeah, oh, I love it. There. But yeah, so I've got so, Yeah, so my latest thing is one of my friends is threatening to stand for general election. Um, against Robert Jenrick, which right. is fantastic for for Newark. He's a really good guy as well. He's a he's a barrister, so really? uh, prosecutes paedophiles and murderers for a living. So doesn't, well, we he doesn't need... do the big books, you know, sort of big books barrister work, you know, where you get paid a fortune. He does the yeah. public prosecution stuff. So well, we uh, need we need more of them. Absolutely, you know, we, need, we need more people. So yeah, so that's kind of my that's kind of my social activities heavily mixed up in that and yeah. sort of the you know, and that I've made a lot of friends I've only been in Newark five years and I've made yeah. so many friends when I, mean, I arrived in Newark I knew two people yeah yeah, yeah. I've made so many friends off the back of that because generally as a, as a I suppose for a, a lot of people when you live in a town you know if you've got kids in the school you make friends that way my yeah. kids don't go to school where I live so you know, they you know, they're, they're in a completely different place so yeah it's kind of it was like, well, how do you meet people? And I don't work. I don't. I don't work in Newark, other than the fact I work for myself from home these days. But 
you know, how do you make friends and things. So, yeah, yeah so that's kind of my social life um, sort of in, in, in Europe. I mean, because the big thing, my, my the big thing I do sort of for myself that's not work related is, is, is coaching. I mean, I finished my master's at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, so I've now got a co- master's in coaching, leadership and management. And yeah. my focus is on um, highly sensitive children. Right. Um, so I do a lot of work with um, children who are highly sensitive, which is a whole other subject in itself. Uh, children with autism and it's, things like it's that? It's children. Or? Well, yeah, there's a lot of crossover between autism and high sensitivity. High sensitivity is more... So like is, anxiety and things yeah, like that? Yeah, it can be for some kids. But right. it's it's 15 to 20% of people are highly sensitive. Right. Um, and it's so your senses are heightened. You're, you're more likely to get overwhelmed. You know, you're more emotional. Right. Um, and obviously in, ch- in children... That's difficult. So, um, yeah. so the other business I've got is orchid transformations, which is because to describe these high sensitive children as orchids, right? Because an orchid in the right soil in the right environment, right, well, right treatment will thrive and will be the most yeah. beautiful flower ever. You don't look after it; it doesn't thrive. Yeah. You no. Know, if you call everybody else a dandelion, you know, you can put uh, put an, uh, the average child in a crack in the ground and they'll thrive. Yeah. You know, you'll still get flowers and they'll still do well. Orchid children either thrive or don't. Well, Albert Einstein said something very, very interesting one day, and he said, um, "If you judge a goldfish by its ability to climb a tree, yeah. that goldfish will never achieve anything." Yes. And I think that that can be applied to children. Yes. I, 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 to be fair, I use that one again because my, yeah. my my daughter's not the greatest academically. Yeah. Um, lovely, lovely girl, one of the nicest girls you'd ever meet, but she's not the greatest academically. And when she was a bit younger, she used to get quite upset about it. Yeah. You know, and she said, "Look, you know, the education system isn't built for everybody. No. You know, you you will you will find what." makes you um special and where your skills will sit as you get older in life yeah i said well, my partner now is a testament to that he left school yeah. at 14 with not a qualification to his name yeah um and he's now you know he's a, an incredibly clever guy and yeah. he's um he like, he's a m4 m3 erp system expert um, right. does a uh, technical expert so he programs it he you know he does amazing things with it yeah uh, very very clever um and so yeah not a qualification to his name but yeah it's uh, and you think, well, how does school work? I mean, I always describe school, and I was I was talking to a special needs um, teacher a few weeks ago, and school one of my little orchids is going to. Of uh, school's like a rectangle, you know, yeah. it's a rectangular tunnel. If you're rectangular, you you'll fit. slide down it nicely. Yeah. If you're if you're a, if you're a sphere, if you're a nice little ball, you'll roll down it, but not pick much up. Yeah. Which is what you find with highly sensitive children who are thriving. Yeah. Um, which is like my daughter's like that. She's nearly ten, and quite frankly, she'd be better off not at school. Yeah. Um, she teaches herself quicker than anybody else i mean lockdown was brilliant for her because she was able to work at her own level yeah um and then you've but if you're a triangle which you know most kids with character are triangles you know if you're a triangle you're either that you're either poking the walls of the school and upsetting them or they're trying to knock the corners off you yeah you're never going to fit no well i mean the basis of our education system was set up in victorian times and it was geared towards people leaving school and going to factories yeah. that's why they're in lines that's why they have to ask to go to the toilet there's set break times yeah. Yeah. as there would be in a factory yeah um i mean obviously that's that's my and i went to school a long time ago so for any educators out there if i'm wrong then i apologize i'm not trying to be controversial um but I, I do think that we still have that kind of attitude yeah, where one you know, size fits all. Yeah, one size fits all. And it and doesn't. And, no, yeah. I know. I, 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 yeah. I come. I mean, like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm a massive proponent of it. When my daughter gets upset, I'm like, look, don't worry about school. Yeah. You'll find your way. Yeah, you'll, doesn't matter. You'll be don't, fine. You'll do all right. Yeah, don't stress out about it. It'll be all right. Whereas my boy doesn't even have to study for exams. Yeah, you know, he just he just he doesn't even, doesn't do anything. Just goes in and smashes it. Yeah, I'm like, where do you get that from? Yeah, and then I'm like, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, I mean, yeah three, let's have three types of school you know one for the triangles one for the squares you know a lot of schools are closing things like they're closing their um so you know their, their mechanics workshops they're closing yeah. you know, they don't do so much woodwork and things like that we think there's a lot of kids out there yeah that, who actually that's where they thrive but yeah. apparently the kids i've talked to i've talked to a few people about it the kids don't want it no you no know, they because they want to be youtubers or they want to be tiktokers or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. whatever it may be they're not they don't want to get their hands dirty and i think no. back now i mean i think back to the lads that i was at school with who didn't thrive academically i mean yeah. there's two of them that i know of who've got their own garages and they're doing very well thank you very much yeah. you know they you know there's you know, they've all there's a lot of them are doing really really well yeah without that yeah just because you're not academically inclined yeah. doesn't mean that you're not going to i mean my son came up to me the other day and he, I said, he was like he was like dad I'm like what he said, uh, I've decided what I want to be when I grow up. And he goes, all right, what do you want to be? And he went, well, you know how we built the shed and we did this in the garden and we did that in the garden? Yeah. And I went, yeah. So I really enjoyed that. So I think I'm going to be a bricklayer. Mm. And I went, 
fair play, mate. There's, there's money in that. Brilliant. Yeah. No, go on then. Do yeah. you know? Do what you want to do. Yeah, I'm encouraging my lad to go down the, the trades route because I yeah. say to him, um, he's a bit of a free spirit too. But I say to him, you know, go and go, you know, get an apprenticeship. Yeah. You no, know, go and go and learn your trade. Work under somebody for a few years. Get that yeah. experience, and then you can be self-employed, and you'll never be out of work. Now, if you're a spark or a plumber, no, anything, no, any kind of trade, you'll never be out of work, and you'll be free to do what you yeah, want. Yeah. And also, less and less state. people are doing it. So, yeah. if anything, the price is going to go yeah, up yeah. and up and you up. You won't be a waste. Bricklayers will be millionaires by the time we're sixty. I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You won't say, but you won't. They won't ever be out of work, will they? Exactly. All, and the less the skills are there, you no, know, yeah. people aren't learning them and things. Then. Yeah. You know, the more the more that men are feminized, the better yeah. it's going to be for the ones who are not. Exactly. Well, that's true. Yeah, there's yeah. always going to be a space, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. All right. Well, listen, that, that brings us to the end wow. of today's show, Gillian. Um, that's, you know, episode 24 in the can. Thank you very much for coming along. I found that to be really interesting, um, talking about your career journey, the different areas that you've moved into, you know, and where you are now and things like that. So, Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, and if anybody wants to reach out to Gillian as a direct result of the show, feel free to do so. She follows the um, Wear Many Hats page on LinkedIn. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Bye, Gillian. Bye.